This program is brought to you by Emory University. Thank all of you for being here, and especially you, President Carter. Yeah. It's, very, it's quite an honor to have you here in our short center and for your agreeing to participate on our on ongoing series of creativity conversations where we've explored perspectives on creativity from a wide range of artists and thinkers, including uh, playwright Edward Albee, the evolutionary biologist E.O. Wilson, the composer Philip Glass, and you. All right. <laughs> So uh, you're a peanut farmer, a politician, a peacemaker, a president, a painter, and a poet. And some would also say philosopher. Uh, these are just some of your many endeavors in life, which are, has been a very full life by any, by any measure imaginable. In fact, you're the writer of over 20 books. Uh, including a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. You've won a Grammy Award. You're a member of the Georgia Writers Hall of Fame. Uh, have works of nonfiction, poetry, fiction, and memoir. And so it's really this artistic side of you that we'd like to explore today. So I'm grateful for your willingness to do so. And I'm just going to jump right in here and ask you, do you think of yourself as an artist? Yes. Let me explain first, I've got a bandage on my arm because last night I was nauseated all night and they are replacing my bodily fluids today at, uh, at Emory and so uh, I slipped out of the IV to come and be with you all. <laughs> and so, <laughs> it was and, either that or we were gonna have to go there. <laughs> I know, and the reason is that day after tomorrow, Rosa and I leave for uh, Laos and Cambodia and Thailand and, and uh, Vietnam and China. So they want to get me in good shape before we leave. But yes, I, I look on myself as an artist, particularly in the peanut field. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I consider myself to have been the best producer of uh, high quality seed peanuts in Georgia and perhaps in the whole United States. So that's one element mm -hmm. of uh, That's artistry. one dimension. But I also, the fine arts, I, I kind of stumbled on that in a way. When I began to run for president, I wanted people to understand who I was, so I, as I traveled around from one uh, town to another all over the nation, all 50 countries, all 50 states, I wrote, hand wrote a, a book called uh, Why Not the Best? And I couldn't get anybody to publish it, and finally they gave me a few hundred copies for my advance fee, and we sold those for $5 a piece to raise money. So that's how I got started writing. And now I've actually finished 25 books. 25. I'm working on my 26th book. It's which hard will be to out keep up with you. Next October. And my wife always likes for me to announce that they're all still on sale. <laughs> and, <laughs> and while I'm writing, uh, on the few days that I'm at home, which I really enjoy, um, I, I now work on a, a computer. When I first came home from the White House, I, I bought a word processor, which was a very rudimentary and very expensive machine. It cost me $10,000, wow. which I didn't have. And you had to return at the end of each line, and it wouldn't go from one page to another and so forth. And you couldn't move anything from one part to another. So, but that's the way I wrote uh, two or three books. And then uh, now I write on a computer. I get up early every morning when I'm at home, about 5 o'clock, and uh, begin working early. And during the day, if I get tired of the computer, I either go to my farm or ride a bicycle or go swimming. But um, I have uh, a wonderful woodworking shop, so I make uh, furniture. And I also, uh, uh, when I'm not working on a piece of furniture, in the same shop, I, I paint, because you can't make furniture with sawdust in the air and also mm -hmm. use oils and acrylics. So yes, I, and, and I've, I've enjoyed that very much. Can you talk about any of your early influences, people who maybe served as role models for you as you began thinking of yourself as, a, as an artist, as a creative person? Well, I was an avid reader. My, um, when I wrote the book that, for which I, I got the Pulitzer uh, uh, nomination, it's called An Hour Before Daylight. And when I got to the end of the book about my boyhood 
in archery, George, I didn't have any white playmates. And I tried to think who were the five people other than my parents who shaped my life. Only two of them were white. And one of those white people was my school uh, superintendent, Miss Julia Coleman. And she had a standard for little country boys and girls in that small school that was really extraordinary in retrospect. She made us learn the great musical composers. She had a scratchy record player. And every week she would place a certain selections from her own mm -hmm. selection. And we had to name the, the, the composition and who composed it. And she did the same thing with great artists of paintings. Right. And, and we also had to learn how to read and write. But she had a list of uh, books too that, uh, that, that she never thought anybody would read all of them. She had about 100 books and I was the only one that, I'm not bragging, but, well, I, it's a time to brag. Uh, I was the only one that read all the books. And, and for that, I won a, a special award, a painting of the Blue Boy by Gainsborough, oh, right. which I still have mm -hmm. on my country wall. So I would say Miss Julia encouraged me to do that. I was, uh, I didn't know what my future might be, so I studied both uh, uh, typing and shorthand in high school. So when I got to college, I took all my notes in Greg shorthand. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've, I've been can a Can you still read typer those? Since. I'm sorry? Can you still read that? No, I, I might, yeah, I can read, you know, the, the basic things, but I, I, I can write a lot fast on a computer. Do you, <laughs> do you have a favorite uh, work of, of fiction or a uh, favorite writer that um, influenced you either as a child or more recently? Well, I would say that William Faulkner was probably the one that really impacted me more than any other particular writer from the South. And I've always said that my favorite book was Let Us Now Praise Famous Men yeah. um, with James Agee. Mm -hmm. And th that was kind of a picture for me when he wrote it for the New York Times first of my own life. And I saw come to reality the uh, elements of poverty that when I was a child, I, I fairly well took for granted. But, but, but it was an evocative book, and also the um, photographs by Evans brought it to life as well. So I would say that that was a kind of shape uh, that, that really affected me perhaps more than any other. My favorite poet, poet has always been Dylan Thomas, mm -hmm. with whom I didn't become familiar until 1953 when I came back from the Navy. Well, speaking of poetry, I'm going to quote this um, because I've, I found where you once said that writing poetry was a more deeply self-revelatory experience yeah. than other writing. And then also, there were things that appeared in poems that I would never have said verbally or put in prose. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what you mean by that. And well, if you, a, you think that it, it uh, requires a different part of your brain. That's an exact quote. You know, I had written a lot of... I probably had written 15 books before I wrote the book of poetry. And I had tried to explore uh, in the book I mentioned earlier, An Hour Before Daylight, my relationship uh, with my father and with my mother and with the uh, African-American people who lived with me. But I, I, I realized when I began to work on poems that I could express myself much more freely and without restraint. And I began to understand my relationship with my father for the first time in any definitive fashion when I was writing a poem about him. And that's where the title of the book came, Always a Reckoning. And the same way with, with my mother. And I think I realized the depth of my love, even for Rosedon, much more uh, than I had previously when I wrote a poem about her. And I could say things about myself and my relationship with my African-American playmates mm -hmm. that would have been difficult to express without some degree of restraint. I started to say subterfuge in prose. Mm -hmm. But in poetry, for me at least, I don't know about other people that write poems, I, I, I could just let all the barriers down and express myself as though I didn't need to be accountable for for what I wrote. Sounds like it's a more immediately emotional experience it or is. medium for you. 
Well, I have, I have a, a whole file cabinet of, of different versions of my poems. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first is kind of a, uh, I just sit, it, sit sometimes at the computer when I was writing it, and I would just close my eyes and, and just let every thought that came to my brain be expressed without any consideration for syntax or a punctuation or sentence structure or anything else. And then I would go from there and, and fine tune the uh, words down to the, to the version that was eventually published. I, I was, when I went home from the White House, there were two poets who came to Plains who were friends of my brother Billy. Uh, and, and they uh, took me under their wing. One of them was, was Miller Williams, mm -hmm. the other was James Whitehead. They came to Plains to give a poetry reading and uh, we were in a cafe that was being run by Billy's widow after he died. And, they, and I told them that I liked to write poems, but I didn't know how. And they agreed to take me on as a student. And they said, it's gonna be really tough if you want it. I said, make it tough as you can. Mm -hmm. We had one rule, and that was they could never give me a word. Every word in all of my books so far had been my own. And so they could say this line is really contrived or artificial, or you've strained yourself to get a, a rhyme, but I, I never would let them give me a word to put in the poetry. And then um, Miller Williams, uh, who was the poet of the year in America for, I think, 1993, I'm not sure, he gave the second inaugural poem for Clinton's right. uh, presidency. And Miller would send off one of my poems every now and then to a quarterly poetry magazine, which is always very embarrassing to me because 90% of them were turned down and uh, we didn't identify this is a form of president's poem, you know, just, and so. Uh, Did you but, get some rejections? A lot of, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. three-fourths rejections, <laughs> yes. And then after the poem was rejected, a rejection with which I never agreed, by the way. <laughs> of course um, not, I would think not. <laughs> then I would discuss with Miller Williams what was it about the poem that was faulty? And then I would try again. So I, in my file cabinet, which I've never shown to anybody, not even <laughs> Rosen, uh, I probably got 30 versions of each one of the poems that were finally wow. published. So that's your process of writing poetry. What, what about for fiction? How did you learn to go about writing a novel? And had you written no, uh, fiction before? Had you written short stories? I had written short stories. Miss Judy Coleman, to whom I refer, every now and then, we had every Friday afternoon, we had what was called a ready writing contest. She would put three uh, titles up on the blackboard and we would write one page theme about any one of those three that we wanted to choose. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we would hand them in and get graded on it. So I learned you know, how to diagram a sentence. I learned not to split infinitives. I learned not to end sentences in prepositions. Mm -hmm. I'm, very, I'm more strict on that than in New York Times editors yes. are, yes. but uh, <laughs> so I learned all that from Miss Judy. So I can spell and I can I can write, but I learned that from her. And so when I got ready to write most of my books, they've not been fiction. They've been about some element of my life that I wanted to share with other people. And one of them is about my first election, uh, which is called Turning Point, and it describes uh, how. The nation's politics changed with a one person, one vote uh, decision by the Supreme Court. And um, an, another one is called Our Endangered Values, which, which pointed out the basic American, excuse me, moral standards uh, that I thought were being violated a few years ago. And so my books have given me a forum that far exceeds the opportunity as an Emory professor. By the way, that's one element of my life that you failed to mention. I'm a mm -hmm. professor Absolutely. for 28 years. Absolutely, right. <laughs> I was gonna get to that. Okay, well. <laughs> you uh, beat me to it. I can make us a, a lecture, even or give us answer to a question at the annual uh, town hall meetings, and it may or may not get covered in the news media, but if I really wanna say something, then I can mm -hmm. write a book about it. And I go on the lecture circuit, and uh, having been president, I don't have any trouble getting on Larry King or whoever I want to get. So I have a, a, an opportunity to have a, a 
a broad forum that comprises millions of people to put my, my views forward. So I, that's one thing that I've used it for. I, I became concerned about, getting back to the fiction work, I, I, I became concerned about the uh, totally distorted presentation of the history of the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. Almost all of the histories that I have read, and I have read a lot of them, are completely biased toward uh, the northern part of our country. Every battle, ultimately that shaped the outcome of the revolution was fought in the south. From St. Augustine to Savannah, which was very important to, to uh, um, and then just go, go up the coast, Charlotte mm -hmm. uh, and, and so forth. And um, I think that that uh, uh, in, impelled me to write a novel about it. So I, I, I began to study uh, how to write fiction on my own. And uh, I found a few professors, one of whom was at Emory, mm -hmm. who, who met with me and, and gave me some advice. And, and so I began to, to, uh, to read about the Revolutionary War and I combined my own family history, which I knew quite well, back to 16, so on, 100, so, uh, as they moved down here and, and, and became involved in the Revolutionary War. So I really enjoyed that, that uh, challenge and that opportunity to tell the story. Has there ever been a time when you felt like, since the days of Miss Julia <clears throat> on, that you felt that your creative spirit was blocked in any way, that you, that you couldn't write or you couldn't paint or you couldn't do wood, woodworking? Is there a moment when you just felt like it wouldn't work for you then? Well, one of the, I, I can't say that I have been seriously blocked for an extended period of mm -hmm. time. You know, I guess I've had what you call writer's block. Right. But, but usually if I have writer's block in the afternoon or night, I don't know what it is about me, but when I wake up early in the morning, quite often before I get out of bed, I think about the paragraph I want to write. <laughs> or I think about the answer that I was looking for the previous day and couldn't find. So uh, also when I, when I get tired of uh, writing or run out of ideas on a fiction book or, or, or nonfiction, I can always go to the, my wood shop, which is just 20 steps away, and uh, design a piece of furniture. Uh, I went to Georgia Tech, so I know how to, to do mechanical drawing. And uh, I pick out the right kind of wood. I'm, I'm kind of an expert on different kinds of wood mm -hmm. all over this nation and some others. And then I, I build a piece of furniture, which might take you know, 150, 200 hours to build uh, a, a nice piece of furniture. And then, um, when I was in the Navy, I was the United States Armed Forces Institute um, officer on the battleship. It's called USAPI. And USAPI courses were designed to let an officer on a ship that had an advanced degree or a college degree teach the enlisted men or other officers courses that you could get free of charge, correspondence courses, mm -hmm. but you actually taught them. So one of my students on the on the battleship. That was preparation for your professorial role. That's right, it was. <laughs> and it was, uh, wanted to learn how to paint. So the, the U.S. Armed Forces Institute was very generous. They had a very elaborate uh, opportunity for anybody to get the equipment you needed to, to paint pictures, oils, or whatever you wanted. So I, I ordered this, this happening of, of good things for him but he left the ship before it arrived and he resigned from the Navy. So I inherited it. So I began to paint that way. And then did you take any more formal lessons after that? No, I've never had a formal lesson, unfortunately. When you, if you look at my paintings, you'll see. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. I'm but, just impressed that you've stayed with it. All, all well, that. I enjoy it. And there are about 50 of my paintings at the Carter Center right. uh, scattered around on the, on the walls. and. Uh, so I've really enjoyed the uh, painting. I have a, a granddaughter uh, who, uh, who is a professional artist, and, and when she's been uh, down to, to our home like two or three days total, and she's given me some, mm -hmm. some ideas. Pointers. But I, but I really like the painting part. Um, let's talk for a second about the nature of time. Um, I'm assuming you have the same amount of time that the rest of us have. Uh, 24 hours in a day and a certain number of days in the year. 
and yet you are able to accomplish so many different projects and processes and be involved in so many different things that you do. Is that a matter of, of is that a matter of self-discipline? Is it a matter of focus or is there some other special quality that allows you to be both creative and then also very active in, in, a, in a, a large public realm? Well, it's hard to answer the question without being kind of self aggrandizing <laughs> you know, I'm inquisitive, first of all. I like to try new things. Right, that's obvious. And not just in the arts, but you know, bird watching. And I, the first time I ever skied down a mountain, I was 62 years old. And, uh, and Rosen was... There's still hope for me, though. Well, I think... <laughs> You know, we like to try new things. We've become pretty accomplished bird watchers now as well, and, and so forth. But I like to, to explore new ideas mm -hmm. and, and test what I can do. And also, I, I think a, an element of it is just creating something, even if it's a, a well-constructed stool that you designed yourself right. and you went out in the woods and got the lumber and you cut the wood. And, you know, that, that kind of thing really appeals to me. And, and having a thought about, about the uh, painting. I think, I think the very last painting I did I went to Damascus, Syria, and I took a photograph of the street called Strait, where St. Paul walked, walked down the street mm -hmm. called Strait. So when I came home, I painted that. Uh, that. But I, I'm not a, I don't train to be an expert artist, but I enjoy that. Sounds like, like it's one way for you to hold on to the experience that you had when you were traveling or a moment or That's some true. sort of. That's certainly true. Yes, and, and a lot of my paintings have been office scenes around my childhood, around Plains. Mm -hmm. Rosa and I were both born in this little town, Plains. When I was four years old, I lived next door to my future wife, who was just one, <laughs> one year old. And so we have an advantage in writing uh, memoirs and also in painting and, and so forth of having been in the same community all our lives, just about so we go off and come back. So we, around the streets of Plains, are still folks with whom I lived and, and, and worked and cared for 75 years ago. Right. And, and so it's, it's kind of a close-knit thing. And so I, I think that is, um, is something that, that gives me a, a, a chance to try different things in a, in a pleasant way without being in a strange environment. And, and then um, I, I like to stay busy. I, I am disciplined. I, I stay on time. Mm -hmm. Uh, pretty much. I got that from my father and from the Navy, which always shocked my campaign workers and the people <laughs> with whom I visited. They would never expect me to get there on time when I was actually present. But I, but I get, I, I stay on time. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to use what, what, what uh, uh, opportunities I have. And we, we take a lot of exercise too. We, we ride bikes and play tennis and swim and, and walk in our woods. We have a fairly large farm that's been in our family for a long time. Well, some of the research that's done on creative thinkers has actually pointed to the importance of novelty and mm -hmm. having, having changes in your, in your life, but again, the kind of stability that you have in terms of a sense of place. Uh, one researcher in a recent article in the Harvard Business Review said that optimism is essential to creative thinking. I was wondering, do you think of yourself as an optimist? Yes, I do. Uh, you know, I, I, when you start to... Um conceive a new piece of furniture. Mm -hmm. If you're not an optimist, you can't begin actually work on it because you don't know how it's going to come right. out. See, I, like you have to have kind of a dream that, of, of what might evolve, but also the confidence in yourself, which I guess is partly optimistic, mm -hmm. that you will succeed. And, and, and that's good. When I, when I, the first year I came home from the White House, uh, I was in debt, and I, I was writing uh, my me memoirs. And, and I, uh, I had this rudimentary machine to type on, which wasn't very pleasant. So I began to build furniture. And, and Rosa and I acquired, uh, built a, a cabin in the North Georgia mountains. And I built all the furniture for the whole house. Wow. Beds, shift robes, we call them, mm -hmm. armors, uh, tables, you know. Uh, toilet paper holders, <laughs> everything in the house. Right, right. And, and I really enjoyed that, but it gave me something to do besides think about having been defeated in 1980 for, you know, for re-election as a president. Well, some people say that um, great work comes out of a sense of struggle or disappointment, or creative work comes out of a sense of a struggle or a disappointment in life. And I was wondering if, that, if, if you felt that true, either 
in your own um, you know, political history, but also in the loss of family members or other kinds of sadnesses, if that's been a... You know, I wish I could say yes, <laughs> but I really can't. You know, I know uh, just Dylan Thomas, for instance, who had a tragic life, and, and many others that had tragic lives, and, and out of, the, out of that, uh, the great writers and the torment of their human mundane existence came inspiration. I really can't claim that, although I would like to. Right. Well, I don't, well I, that's not yeah. exactly true. I, I, I don't want to go through torment just so I can have more <laughs> inspiration. <laughs> but, but I think that that uh, is something that, that, that doesn't really apply to me. And uh, just pursuing that a little bit further from a slightly different angle, um, you're a very spiritual person. Spirituality and religion and faith have been very important parts mm -hmm. of your life. And I'm wondering if you see any connection between the spiritual life and the creative life, if those overlap or intersect or, or nurture one another in some form or fashion. Well, I do. I, I think unknown maybe to anybody here, I spend a lot of my time each week uh, preparing for a Bible lesson that I teach every Sunday in my little church at home. And I read through the scripture and I uh, lay the Bible aside. I absorb through hours or several days the essence of that particular uh, excerpt from the Bible. And then I get up early Sunday morning and I, and I write some notes and then uh, after that, I have breakfast with Rosen and, and I dress for church. And then I, I glance down my notes and, I, and then I put them aside and I meditate for a half an hour or an hour. And then when I get to the church, I don't have to look at my notes because it's kind of mm -hmm. been absorbed. But, I, but I've done that, I think this past Sunday was my 509th wow. lesson that I've taught. Mm -hmm. And they've all been uh, recorded, uh, about 350 of them video, and all of them audio recorded. So I, I put a lot of uh, my thought and effort, in, and I don't have any doubt that that has affected me as well. Uh, two of my books have been almost exclusively a self-analysis of my faith. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I have just signed a contract to do another book. Uh, that'll be my book after what I'm working on now. Uh, so yes, I think that's true. Mm -hmm. the, um, we were just talking earlier about you're getting, you've just returned from traveling and you're getting ready to travel oh. um, again to four countries, is that right? Um, Vietnam, mm -hmm. Laos, Cambodia, and Thailand? And China. And China. Yes. Wow. So, um, and as you travel the world and you see the customs and the habits and the patterns that people have in their own artistic life and their own cultural life. I wonder if you see things there that um, influence either how you think about yourself and your work, your, your mm -hmm. creative work writ largely, or even ways that we could learn as a culture from um, some of the habits and patterns and ways of life that you see in other countries. Well, the answer is, uh, is yes. You know, when I left the White House, my first big endeavor in so-called artistic work was to build furniture. And as I traveled around to China and to Denmark and, and to other countries, which I need not name, I would derive from expert furniture makers in this country advice on, on who was the greatest woodworker in those foreign countries. And I would visit them and talk to them and listen to their philosophy. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, there, there is, is a man named Sam Aloof who died a couple of months ago, who's the greatest woodworker that I've ever known in my life. And he was an intimate friend of mine. Mm -hmm. But, but the, the building of furniture and the assimilation or application of uh, basic philosophy of life, I think are interrelated in, 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 in a way. And, my, my favorite artist is, is, uh, is Van Gogh. And when I go to the Netherlands, I, I try to kind of immerse myself in, in his early life. And then obviously when I go to France, I, I go to some of the museums there. So 
so there's no doubt that I bring back to mm -hmm. my little workshop, you know, some of the things that I learned from foreign experiences. Talk a little bit about what you mean by that, uh, about the, what you do in woodworking is connected to a philosophy of life. Um, I wonder how, how, what that means in terms of your daily life um, or your choices. Or is it, is it about the process that, you know, putting something together and creating something? Or is it about... Um, well, you asked me a while ago about optimism, and, uh -huh. and I, I might repeat the same answer. But I, when, when I get ready to uh, create or make a, a piece of furniture, I try to make something that no one has ever made before. Uh -huh. You know, uh, to put my own brand uh, on it. And then... Um, I begin to envision sometimes while I'm flying around in airplanes and, and away, from, away from home, right. and I make sketches on scratch pads about what I, the different, different joints and, and that sort of thing. And, um, and then I, can't, I can hardly wait to get back to my wood shop <laughs> just to start putting it into reality. And then I, you have to make a detailed plan to make sure that the joints fit and, and, and that sort of thing. And, and, and then to begin actually to build it it's really uh, a tedious thing because I do a lot of my work uh, with hand tools. I've got a completely outfitted shop. I could do everything almost with power tools. Mm -hmm. But for instance, one day a, a man up, up near my mountain cabin gave me a, uh, a, a walnut stump that was laying out in his yard. And, and part of the, he had blown it up with dynamite. So part of it was the trunk of the tree about that much and part of it was underground originally. So we loaded it in the back of my pickup truck, and when I got back to Plains, I, did, I decided that I would make a, a, a table out of that hunk of wood just using uh, tools that my grandfather had. Hmm. And it was really tedious. You can't imagine how many strokes of a plane and, and, that, and a saw it takes to do it. So I, I really like to do that, and, and I've made a, a good bit of furniture uh, uh, called green wood furniture. Rose and I, for instance, went out behind our house one day and cut down a, uh, a white oak tree. And she and I dragged it to the house, the log behind us. And I, and I skinned the tree uh, with a draw knife and then, and then that left the inner bark and then I, I took out the inner bark about this wide and, and put it in a barrel of water. That later became the seed of the tree. Mm -hmm. And then you, you take the, the uh, parts of a, of a rapidly drying, cut down green tree, and, and you fit them together so that you don't have to have nails or, or pegs or screws or glue or anything else. J just how, how rapidly the, 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 uh, the wood dries binds it in mm -hmm. in an in a indestructible way. So I, you can tell I really like to do right. something. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I got carried away. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. But, but we made, I made 10 chairs out of that uh, log and four stools. And, uh, and one thing I should mention is that every year I give the Carter Center either one of my pieces of furniture mm -hmm. or one of my paintings to auction off. And they bring a nice, a nice price. Yeah. Well, it sounds like there's a, there's a real uh, fascination with detail as well as this kind of desire to, to make something. And I'm wondering how that connects to, we've been talking primarily about your work as an artist, um, and, but also in your work in the public realm, which has a kind of creative artistry to it as well, mm -hmm. how you see that more private side of yourself related to the, the larger public arena in which you <clears throat> create work. Um, let, me, let me say one thing first before I answer your question. I don't, I don't consider myself to have any particular talent to write or to paint or to make furniture. So I believe that almost anyone that wants to adopt uh, those three pastimes or others are able to do it in, in a very self-satisfying way. And sometimes there is a hidden talent there that no one ever anticipated that might make that person a master. I'm not. So I wanted to say that quickly before I forget. Anyway, uh, as far as my public life is concerned, yes, I would say that the number one goal of my public life 
for the last 30 years has been to bring peace to Israel. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, to bring peace to Israel's neighbors. They're inseparable. And so um, with my teaching at Emory, with my lecturing at universities around the country, with my writing of books, I'm able to pursue that goal through my craft, I would say, as a writer. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and lately, I've, I've had uh, uh, an editorial in the International Herald Tribune that was published in the New York Times and also published in the Jerusalem paper uh, about the plight of the Palestinians in Gaza as they face another winter without any shelter, since that shelter has been destroyed. So I'm able to say things like that, you know, utilizing my writing ability and skills that I couldn't say otherwise. So, so the, I think that the public life and, and the uh, artistic life are intertwined. You were saying a few minutes ago that you think that anybody who has a, an interest or a desire yeah. and some discipline um, can, can work on writing or can presumably be a musician or an artist of some sort or at least mm -hmm. develop that skill within themselves. So, we have, a, we have an initiative on our campus on creativity in the arts and innovation, and many of the people here and others have been involved in that. And I'm, I'm wondering about, what do you think that creativity is something that can be taught? I think creativity is something that can be inspired by a teacher, mm -hmm. and I guess that's a definition of teaching. Right. Yes, I, I, I think if you t took just an average group of, uh, of Emory students, say 16 in a small class, and said, why don't we decide this semester to evolve among, among each, within each one of you, a new talent or skill that you never dreamed that you had, but which may titillate your interest. I think, I think all the experiments would probably be, be uh, come to fruition, because so many people are eager to help. And uh, you know, if, if anybody wants to build furniture, all they've got to do is, is go to to um, a, a wonderful um, hardware store uh, not too far from here, and, and they have uh, courses and books. I, I learned most of my uh, woodworking skills, and even the most intricate joints from books that I bought or that some people gave me. So, on the internet too. And the internet also, yes. So I, I don't think anybody ought to underestimate what they can do. I wrote a, another book. <laughs> called The Virtues of Aging. Uh, a, a lot of people said that must be your briefest book, but, <laughs> but, but I, tried to, I tried to analyze my own life and I studied quite a long time the lives of other people who started their remarkable careers late in life. Mm -hmm. to, to show that, that, that um, this is an untapped resource that all of us have. If you take a, a uh, for instance, a, a policeman in New York, they probably, New York City, they probably go to, go to their job when they're 20 years old. They work for 20 years. They retire when they're 40, 40. And, uh, and so forth. Well, and, and some presidents are re retired prematurely too. Uh, <laughs> I was 56 when I retired. Right. But, but the point is that, that anybody who retires, whether they are 40 or 65 or whatever, they have an opportunity during those free remaining years, that may be 25 more years, or maybe nobody knows, to go back in their consciousness, maybe since they were in high school, and, and identify something they really wanted to do but never did have time to do it, or their job interfered with it. Like, like learn to speak Spanish, or learn to play a guitar, or ukulele, or, or learn to paint a picture, or, or learn to build a stool, things, things of this kind. So I, I think that that's something that, uh, that, would, that really is, uh, is important. And in Virtues of a Aging, I, I pick, pick out some very uh, prominent people who never dreamed before their retirement years that they had that talent. Can you give some examples? Well, I, I don't know if I can remember any specific <laughs> examples. I wrote a book a long time ago. Right. But, but some, one, I remember one, one example I used was a guy that uh, decided when he was about 50 years old to run the Boston Marathon, mm -hmm. and he was one of the, one of the high, high enough folks. Yeah. So we've talked again about the virtues of aging, and then as far as young people are concerned, 
Um, we live in a very complicated and challenging world. Um, certainly you did too mm -hmm. um, growing up and we still do. Um, and so as we have students who are preparing for a life, um, whether it's you know, a profession or um, co contributing to society or their families, um, what advice do you have to them in terms of living the kind of full and creative life that you've been able to? Well, I, I have one special advice. To, let's say, a, a young person who finishes college and maybe is either unable to get a job or is not quite ready to decide how to spend the rest of his or her life. Join the Peace Corps. Uh, some of the top people when I was president and since then that have helped me most have been young people who went into the Peace Corps, capitalized on what they had learned academically, and then had their whole hearts and minds stretched by the awareness of other people's needs and how they could be assuaged, and came back and, and had a much fuller life. And that's one of the best uh, entries you can have on any sort of uh, you know, history of a person's life. Uh, recommending yourself, and that is that I served two and a half years in the Peace Corps in South Africa, mm -hmm. like my grandson did. Or I served two and a half years in India, like my mother did my when mother. she was 70 mm -hmm. years old. And it, it expanded her life. She came home from the Peace Corps, and she um, made over 500 speeches after she came home. Uh, one was extolling the Peace Corps life, but the other one was saying that you're never too old to learn something new and to do something exciting and challenging and adventurous and unpredictable. Yes, I've read that memoir of, of, that you have with your mother and that experience and how she was completely, her, many of her ideas and expectations were completely shifted over that time. What, what, were, what were your thoughts when you heard your mother was going into the Peace Corps? <laughs> Mother came down to the peanut warehouse where Billy, my brother, and I were working. And she announced, uh, I've decided to go into Peace Corps. And Billy and I both said, Mama, we think that's a great idea. <laughs> and she was absolutely distressed because she didn't want to go into Peace Corps. <laughs> she wanted you to talk her she, out of it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh, I see. She, she, okay. just, she had just seen Sounds an, like most families, yeah. She had just seen an advertisement on the television that said, Join the Peace Corps, age is no limit. And, but once we said, go ahead, she was kind of stuck with it and, and couldn't. Uh, so uh, maybe that's, maybe that's, what, what, maybe that's part say. of life also. I wrote a poem about my mother that I'll read after a while. Okay, yeah, actually, we, that's what I was going to go to next. Ooh, okay. and, um, but before I do that, you mentioned in passing that Peace Corps and also H Habitat for Humanity. Absolutely. And that is another place yeah. where you've helped to well, create yeah structures and places and that's, what it, that, that's where we're going Thursday Rose and I go and work on habitat houses for one solid week uh, every year and we go overseas one year and back in this country the next next year last year we built homes in uh, Alabama Mississippi and Louisiana in the Katrina damaged area and Thursday we go to uh, Thailand first and then to the other countries that we just mentioned in Thailand, Rosa and I will be, uh, will be building uh, 61 houses. And, uh, and in the meantime, in four other countries, volunteers are already working on the houses. We have 3,000 volunteers in wow. all. And one of the places we'll go is to Cambodia. <clears throat> and we have 21 uh, homeowners that will work side by side with me and Rosa in Cambodia. All of them formerly lived on a garbage dump. And the, and the government outlawed the shacks that had been on the dump site, mm -hmm. and they destroyed the sites. So those are the people that will, will move into their houses. Uh, and then we also will build some houses in the Chengdu, uh, China area, where the earthquake destroyed homes. So we do this uh, and, and really, really enjoy. Yeah, it sounds very that. rewarding. What it is, and, and Rosen now is able to do almost every job on a house building site, whether it's built with, with two by fours and, and lumber or whether it's built with uh, concrete blocks. Almost all of the, the homes we'll build this next uh, 10 days will be concrete blocks. That they, they have a scarcity of uh, lumber over there. 
But it's a very ch challenging and exciting thing. Uh, two or three years ago, we built 100 homes where my mother served in the Peace Corps in India. Uh, and we had, uh, we, we always try to finish the house in five days. But those particular 100 homes we finished in four days. Because on Tuesday morning, Brad Pitt showed up. <laughs> and uh, he wanted to volunteer. <laughs> Most of the time when, when famous people come, they work as long as the TV cameras are there. Right. And when the TV cameras mm -hmm. are gone, they're gone. But he stayed the whole week. Mm -hmm. And so we finished the house right. a day early with a lot of extra volunteers. Yeah, that sounds like but, fun. But it's, but it's the kind of thing, too, that I don't think ought to be uh, excluded from the arena of maybe uh, artistry. Right. Is building a house side by side with somebody who's never had a decent home. I think that's a wonderful way to, mm -hmm. to tie together. Um, no, it sounds like it's a wonderful connection in various threads of your life, the, the interest in craft, the interest in um, making things, and then the international dimension, and also your work on behalf of people who are, who are homeless or sick or okay. ailing. You know, when, when the turn of the century came, I was asked to make two major speeches. One of them was in Taiwan, and the other one was in Oslo, uh, Norway. And, um, they assigned me a subject. What is the greatest challenge the world faces in the new millennium? Mm -hmm. And I gave the same speech in both places with a few changes. But I, I think the greatest challenge we face is the growing chasm between rich people and poor people. And I emphasize the word growing because each year the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, comparatively speaking. And when that happens, to cross that chasm is almost impossible. Uh, if, if you have a very highly committed orientation toward your religion, whatever it might be, or very highly altruistic inclinations, how do you put it into practice? Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to break down that barrier without making the poor people feel inferior and without making you feel superior. And, but Habitat is one of those things, there are others as well, that lets you work side by side with a person who has never had a decent home. One of the homes that we built in, uh, in uh, uh, see, I can't remember now the country, but we had built 293 homes. Hmm. And um, the woman who moved into the house we built, the Philippines, uh, had, she and her three children had been living in an abandoned septic tank, hmm. which wouldn't be as, nearly as big as this rug we're sitting on. And they covered themselves up every night with a plastic right. sheet. And then she moved into a nice home that she herself had helped to build. So I think that's the kind of thing that, that I wouldn't exclude from, uh, from the subject that from we're the, talking about From today. the creative life. Right. Well, um, on this, continuing the subject, the creative life, you yes. agreed that, um, to share with us a few of your poems. Okay. And we'd look forward to enjoy hearing those from you. If you want to introduce them in some right, way. I will. And tell us what we're, I, as I understand it, this book is divided into four sections. Is that right? Uh -huh. yeah. Well, I've already mentioned one of them about my mother. Mother, mother was a, uh, a registered nurse. And she went to India um, and ultimately became an untouchable because she dealt with bodily fluids and with blood and she, swept, she cleaned up her own place and she dealt with medicines. And that's not something that a Brahmin will do. And mother had never seen uh, leprosy. And in fact, although she was a nurse, finished her training at Grady Hospital and practiced in Plains, uh, she had a fear of leprosy because we read about it in the Bible so much. The, the title of this poem is based on, the poem is based on a letter that my mother wrote. And the title is, Miss Lillian Sees Leprosy for the First Time. And it's, it's in the words that, that my mother would have used. When I nursed in a clinic near Bombay, a small girl, shielding all her leprous sores, crept inside the door. I moved away. But then the doctor called, you take this case. First I found a mask and put it on. Quickly gave the child a shot, and then, not well, I slipped away to be alone and scrubbed my entire body red and raw. I faced her treatment every week with dread and loathing. 
of the chore, not the child. As time passed, I was less afraid and managed not to turn my face away. Her spirit bloomed as sores began to fade. She had raised her anxious, searching eyes to mine to show she trusted me. We'd smile and say a few Marathi words, then reach and hold each other's hands. And then love grew between us so that later, when I kissed her lips, I didn't feel unclean. This is um, a poem I wrote when my um, early ignorance about racial segregation came to an end. I, I think I said earlier that I lived in a community I didn't have any white neighbors. And my black neighbors, my African-American neighbors, we fought each other, we, we wrestled with each other, we fished together, worked in the field, and so forth. And uh, there was never any distinction between us. And this is called the Pasture Gate. This empty house three miles from town was where I lived. Here I was black, where here I was back, and found most homes around were gone. The folks who stayed here now were black, like Johnny and A.D., my friends. As boys, we worked in daddy's fields, hunted rabbits, squirrels, and quail, caught and cooked catfish and eels, searched the land for arrowheads, tried to fly the smallest kite, steered barrel hoops with strands of wire, and wrestled hard at times we'd fight. Without a thought who might be boss, who was smartest or the best, the leader for a few brief hours was who had won the last contest. But then we were 14 or so as we approached the pasture gate. They went to open it and then stood back. This made me hesitate. Sure, it must have been a joke, a tripwire maybe, they had planned. I reckon they had to obey their parents' prompting or command. We only saw it vaguely then, but we were transformed at that place. A silent line was drawn between friend and friend, race and race. That's the first time I was separated from my African-American playmates. And I presume that their parents told them that since we were about 14 years old, it was time right. for them to acknowledge my superiority. It hurts me to say it. I'll read one that I wrote about my submarine years, which were very important. This is called Life on a Killer Submarine. <laughs> This was a, the first ship the Navy built after the Second World War. And I was lucky enough to be the only officer assigned to it for a long time. And uh, it was, a, it was a, an experimental ship that for the first time was designed exclusively to kill other submarines. And in doing so, you have to be extremely careful to be absolutely quiet so that another submerged ship can't hear you and uh, focus in on where you are and therefore destroy you. I had a warm, sequestered feeling deep beneath the sea, moving silently, assessing what we could hear from far away because we ran so quietly ourselves, walking always in our stocking feet. We'd listen to the wild sea sounds the scratch of shrimp, the bowheads moan, the tantalizing songs of humpback whales. We strained to hear all other things, letting ocean lenses bring to us the steady, throbbing beat of screws, the murmurs of most distant ships or submarines that might be hunting us. One time we heard with perfect clarity a vessel's pulse 400 miles away 
And remember that in spite of everything we did to keep our sounds suppressed, the gradient C could focus to our muffled noise, could let the other listeners know where their torpedoes might be aimed. We wanted them to understand that we could always hear them first, and knowing, be inclined to share our love of solitude, our fear, that one move, threatening or wrong, could cost the peace we yearned to keep, and kill our hopes that they were thrilled like us to hear the same whale's song. It was a strange uh, life mm -hmm. uh, in this small submarine to walk around always without shoes on, to be absolutely silent. And uh, we had an enormous uh, array of, of sonar gear on, on the bow. It made the ship look very peculiar, but it could listen. As I said in the poem, sometimes we hear a ship 400 miles away and we could hear all kinds of uh, sea animals. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then to realize that the people that you were wanting to kill before they killed us may be listening to the whale, same whale. Right. This is the last one I read. It's entitled Rosalind. She'd smile and birds would feel that they no longer had to sing. Or oh, it may be I failed to hear their song. Within a crowd, I'd hope her glance might be for me, but knew that she was shy and wished to be alone. I'd pay to sit behind her, blind to what was on the screen, and watch the image flicker upon her hair. I'd glow when her diminished voice would clear my muddled thoughts like lightning flashing in a gloomy sky. Then nothing in my soul with her aloof was changed to foolish fullness when she came to be with me. With shyness gone and hair caressed with gray, her smile still makes the birds forget to sing. and me to hear this song. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.